Hi, I'm Scott Purdue, and today on Flywire, we're going to do Eagle Ac Academics program, uh, basically the introduction uh, to upset prevention and recovery training. Our overall motto, if you will, is recognize, prevent, and recover. The goal in this course is to teach awareness. That's the recognize part. And then we're going to learn how to prevent from going over the edge of the envelope. And finally, if we do exceed the normal pitch and bank, bank uh, parameters, well, then we're going to learn how to, to recover safely. So please hang with me. I think it's going to be fun. Uh, I promise you. It, there's going to be some benefit here. So hang on to the end. There's a lot of stuff that you need to know before you come fly. Let me begin by saying that this is uh, not spin training, okay? Everybody talks about uh, upset recovery spin training. We do address spins in this course, but only to the extent where we study departure from controlled flight in stall and yaw. Generally, if you actually spin an airplane close to the ground, well, I think you should have an updated will. So, we do this thing. Uh, oh, here's the other thing I want to get on, on the table here before uh, we actually go fly is I want some to talk about some definitions. And uh, uh, mostly, you know, we're going to do this before we get to the meat of the course because it would be nice if we actually speak the same language yeah, to make, uh, make uh, learning a little bit easier for both of us. Uh, after definitions, we're going to talk about aerodynamics and some odds and ends and then uh, things like human factors and aeronautical decision making. <laughs> and we're going to survey the things that commonly cause upset events. Uh, so once we have a handle on those things, <clears throat> we'll get to the meat of the course and we'll discuss what we're going to then actually fly in the air. But we're going to split those up into different videos uh, to make it a little bit easier. The first things, of course, are some basic handling maneuvers that uh, are not commonly practiced in an airplane uh, because we can do it in this airplane. Uh, we're going to do a few spins, yes, but the real lesson to take away from the spin is, training is the spin prevent. Okay? where we don't even want to get into a spin. We recognize the conditions and we recover before that happens. That's what I'd like to be ingrained in your muscle memory. After spins, we're going to concentrate on actual upsets. And with a background in how to do all the different maneuvers that we, need to, that we might need, we're going to try out a few scenarios and we might include automation uh, issues tailored to your airplane type. So, definitions. This is, learning is fun. I think it's fun. I always like to learn something new. And, uh, so that we're going to have some of that. Um, plus, uh, we're going to go flying. So how you're mixing the two together. Well, that's just uh, it's a hoot. So let's dig in and look at a few uh, definitions. The first of which is a lift vector. Uh, have you ever heard of a lift vector? It, well, it'd be probably. But instead of getting really complicated with vector math and equations and such, let's just say that a vector is a force in a direction. It's actually a sum of the different forces acting on a body going in a particular direction. You can see that's the way this lift vector is going. If you haven't thought about it uh, before, but this is actually how an airplane flies. As long as the lift vector is positive and above the horizon, we stay in the air. The pilot, and yes, that means you, controls the magnitude of the vector with the elevator. You also control the orientation of the lift vector with the aileron and the rudder. Okay? Let's talk about angle of attack love angle of attack. Some folks call it alpha because that's the mathematical sim for it, kind of a convenient shorthand. And I'm sure everyone has heard of this. But uh, so from this picture you're going to see that relative wind is this way and if we increase pitch angle of attack is going to go up. If we decrease pitch angle of attack is going to go down. Okay and probably going to go downhill too. Uh, from that picture it's, it's pretty interesting to see the corresponding effect. But at high AOA the lift curve has an abrupt break. That's right here at CL Max. Right here at 10 degrees, uh, there's no problem. 16, we're starting to get some boundary layer separation. And at 17, just one degree, uh, we get the boundary layer break and it's, uh, the airplane is stalled or the wing is stalled. Um, it really doesn't take much to get the boundary layer reattached. We're going to play with alpha in the air. It's lots of fun. Uh, you're going to get really familiar with it and it's a lot of hoot. It's, it's good stuff. The other thing to remember is that at low alpha, the ailerons can control the airplane. In other words, if we unload the airplane, we can still roll it. At high AOA, you want to use the rudder. And uh, you can use ailerons too, but you want to use the rudder. It's that whole adverse yaw thing. 
okay? High AOA, stall, yeah, spin. Anyway, so let's take a look at, uh, tour around some of the other tools we need for orientation. Uh, if there's a horizon outside the window, I recommend using it. But if not, we need an attitude indicator. We're gonna look at steam gauges and a couple of glass representations. And if it's dark and scary night, or uh, it's gray outside the window, the AI is truly uh, our friend. The other tool we need is an airspeed indicator. And hopefully, well, hopefully you've already seen one of those. I'm not gonna show that, okay? And I'd like to define a speed <laughs> for us to use. I know you're thinking, oh geez, not another V-speed. Well, sort of. And it should be specific to your airplane. I'm talking about corner velocity. Others have used it in this context before. Uh, I haven't invented it. Uh, but this is not VA. This is a term from flying fighters. And the definition is the lowest speed where you can attain max G. I'm not interested in fighting another airplane and max performing my airplane uh, in regards to that, but I'm vitally interested in not hitting the ground. Mostly because, well, it's really hard. So uh, let's get a set a G loading target that's reasonable for our airplane. The G limit for an F-33C is plus six minus three. And let me assure you that we're gonna stay far away from that. But for the common, G air, a, common GA airplane, the G limit is 3.8 G. For transport category and fight a, quite a few business jets, that limit's two and a half G, quite a bit less. You can figure out uh, the corner velocity for your airplane by multiplying the one G clean stall speed by the G load. Nobody has perfect hands especially with a lot of adrenaline hitting in your bloodstream, you know. So I'm proposing that a reduced G-load target, okay, and we have a little bit of a margin here. So I bet you if you don't have, that you don't have a G-meter in the airplane. So how do we determine what that actual G is? Well, I don't want to hit the ground, but I also don't want to pull the wings or the tail off either. That would be bad. So if you pull until you're really heavy in the seat, more than normal, then you're probably going to be near 2.5 G. Um, and that's a fine calibration for our target speed. And you can see where this is going, right? I'm going to use this speed reference and pull to not hit the ground very smoothly. I want to emphasize very smoothly. I'm also going to use the speed reference to determine whether I need power or not. If I'm below the reference speed, power goes to full. If I'm above the reference speed, power goes to idle. Simple choice, on off. The F-33C, and any Bonanza for that matter, has a corner velocity reference speed of 155 knots, which is very close to yellow line. And at yellow line, the uh, rudder vader elevator flight control authority approaches uh, about 9G. Well, to be honest, I'd like to stay away from that too. So we're gonna use turbulence speed, which is 140 knots, as uh, approximately, as our reference speed for the F-33C. Most GA airplanes have a fairly narrow speed range, while biz jets have, and airliners have a really wide speed range. And so in GA, we have a little bit of a margin. We need to find a speed reference to maximize our turn. Any speed faster or slower than our reference is gonna result in a larger turn radius, as you can see from this diagram right here. Uh, our goal is to affect the recovery within design limits. If we don't break the airplane, we stand a pretty good chance of walking away, okay? Aerodynamics, let's talk a bit about that. There are some interesting things, aerodynamically speaking, uh, that come into play when you get near the edge of the envelope. I think they're cool, so we're gonna talk, talk about them. Let's look at wings. Uh, in the GA world, uh, most of the time we see is, most of what we see is some version of the Clark Y uh, airfoil, okay? Works great in a straight wing configuration. Uh, they may or may not have enhancements like a little bit of wing twist or VG veins or breaks in the wings to ensure uh, the wing root stalls before the tip. Uh, this improves roll control at high AOA and, uh, and affects adverse yaw. Uh, remember, we need to stall and then yaw before we depart an airplane. For jets, the laminar flow wing has the uh, lowest drag profile. And when the boundary layer finally becomes detached in that kind of uh, wing, well, it's not a benign event. Let's take a look at the, at the AOA and relative lift profile. So uh, this is low angle of attack at minus eight degrees in this one. So we're getting lift and very little drag and the center pressure moves pretty far aft on the wing. Uh, means you're probably going pretty fast and probably downhill. 
Next is cruise AOA. As you can see, the center of pressure here is in the first third of the wing, uh, very near the uh, leading edge. And uh, in this one, we're positive about four degrees angle of attack. And cruise, you're always got a little bit of angle of attack going there. Okay, so uh, uh, it's, all the forces are pretty much balanced, pretty interesting. And slide hit, here is a high angle of attack. This is over 10 degrees. The center pressure moves very far up uh, the wing and uh, you get a lot of lift, but cone, you also get a lot of drag, okay? So not a great place to fly uh, efficiently, uh, to fly the airplane. Uh, back in Charles Lindbergh's day, you know, when they were designing airplanes, they didn't really understand much about wing design and placement to enhance stability. Most airplanes in those days were not very stable. Today, most airplanes are pretty stable in pitch and slightly less so in yaw, but very stable in yaw. But the dihedral effect is an, a stability issue as well. And uh, it has the tendency to raise the low wing uh, because the low wings can have a little greater angle of attack, more, more lift, so it's gonna wanna roll it out, okay? But uh, most GA airplanes and uh, pretty much all the jets have a slightly negative stability in roll. And this makes the aircraft, this makes the aircraft more responsive and uh, feels better. But with the uh, unintended introduction of side slip, the airplane's gonna seek its trim speed and a spiral divergence can develop. It, it happens, that's what this is right here. Stable in yaw, slightly unstable in uh, roll and uh, with a little bit of side slip, there we go. Uh, pretty easy to happen, um, especially in the weather with a little distraction. So, but if the recovery's got to be flown right now and hand flown, and uh, it's very interesting because uh, the speed builds up really fast, okay? Uh, the thrust line of an airplane, uh, whether it's a fan or jet, if it's located under the CG, the thrust has a tendency to pitch the airplane up. If it's above the CG, thrust has a tendency to pitch the nose down, if that makes sense to you. And uh, even if the thrust line is through the CG, Adding power has the tendency, if you're flying straight and level flight and you add power, it's gonna to tend to pitch it up. If you pull power, it's gonna have the opposite effect and drop the nose. It's all a matter of moment arm, and uh, then that, in this case, through the CG is level flight. Okay, it's just physics, just physics. All right, there's another interesting, really cool thing about going on in jets. There's, first, uh, let's talk about the thrust vector effect. With very powerful engines mounted under the wings, the pitching moments can be really high, forcing the airplane nose up with full power and, sh and, and uh, dropping the nose of the idle. This has been a factor in several of the different uh, uh, transport category airplane crashes lately. But it also can be a good thing. United 232, the crash in Iowa over 30 years ago, was crash landed using thrust as a substitute for elevator. And an Airbus in Iraq did the same thing to recover safely after being hit by, with a SAM. It was truly an amazing performance. And then there's another thrust vector thing here. Uh, and it's basically roll due to side slip, okay? Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, you can, if you use the thrust asymmetrically, you can induce roll and control the airplane heading. But one thing is, don't try shooting an ILS this way. The thrust vector can help you, but it can also get you in trouble. <clears throat> if, well, if you don't like thrust vector effect, you can design it a little bit differently. You can put the engines in the back. You put them high in the back, and it solves that for those weird things. But it also does a thing is it forces a T-tail. And you ask, well, what's wrong with a T-tail? Now, it's been used a lot. And, uh, well, it, it puts the tail outside the wing downwash, from my perspective, and you get no buffet uh, in the impending stall. So you can actually hang the airplane up uh, with that remaining elevator authority uh, to a very high deck angle and achieve a very high angle of attack. And when that happens, now the T-tail is in dead air and uh, pitch and rudder authority is reduced. This spells departure in my book and a reduced chance of recovery. And I think you just don't want to stall a T-tail. Nothing good can happen to that. All right. Speaking of jets, <clears throat> it turns out if you really want to go fast, you need to sweep the wing. The drag coefficient goes way up at high Reynolds numbers for straight wings and compressibility is an issue. So how do you avoid that? Yeah. General rule is sweep the wing. 
and this is partially due to spanwise flow, a couple other things going on too. But what happens is that the wing thinks that the uh, airflow is slower than you're actually going through the air. So it's pretty, pretty cool. Another interesting thing about a wing sweep is that the higher AOA, the more effective the rudder is and the less effective the ailerons are. Really remember that. As the high AOA, use the rudder. <clears throat> it's very important. Well, this drag reduction comes at a cost and that is a stall in a swept wing airplane starts at the tip. And on the good bad scale, that's bad. When you take into account that most jets have very high mass and very small flight controls, uh, any maneuver outside the box is unlikely to end well. Inertia and slow response demands lots of altitude for recoveries. <clears throat> Jet pilots are trained to stay away from the edge, but you know they do at times find themselves on or over it. It happens. In light GA airplanes, you generally have more control over the airplane near the edge of the envelope, but to use it without bending something requires some training and familiarity. And that's what this course is designed to teach you about the edge of the world. I mean, teach you about the edge of the world, oh my God, <clears throat> in a uh, more or less safe environment. The F-33C is perfect for that. So you're better, with this, you're going to be better equipped to stay away from that edge in real life. Let's take a look at uh, aerodynamics here. Um, turn rate and radius. Got to talk about that. So constant 30 degree bank angle, 100 knots, <clears throat> our turn rate is 6.5 degrees a second and our radius is 1,500 feet. If we go to 200 knots, holding the same bank angle, the turn rate is halved, but the uh, radius is uh, like quadrupled, okay? That's a whole lot more. It's really, really interesting how that works. And I'll talk about the relationship here in a second. If we do a constant speed of 150 knots, at 15 degrees, we have a turn rate of 2 degrees a second, approximately a radius of 8,000 feet. If we triple the bank angle to 45, the rate goes to 7.2 uh, degrees a second, the radius goes down to 2,000. Big, big change. How does that work? Well, of course, it's a math equation. And basically, it's the bank angle divided by a speed, okay? Of course, there's a you know, constant and tangent and all that kind of stuff going in here, but the relationship is linear. Check it out for 120 degrees, 30 knots is gonna be about five degrees per second, okay? The turn rate, or sorry, the ra that was the turn rate. This is the turn radius. Again, 120 knots. This is the speed as the square, okay, of velocity uh, divided by the bank angle, and it ends up at about 2,200 feet. Okay, as our turn radius. So the important thing is, is to remember it's the square of the speed. So the faster you go, uh, the bigger your turn radius is gonna be, okay? So the reason this is all, all this stuff is important be is because uh, in a nose low recovery at corner velocity, we're going towards the ground now, uh, it's in the vertical. And this turn radius is what, does, it's the same turn, although you know it's in the vertical, it's what decides who stays alive and who goes to the great beyond. Uh, a slightly different uh, equation uh, substitutes for G angle for the bank angle results in this turn radius, but it's exactly the same kind of a turn. Okay, so now that we've got those things going, we need to talk about situational awareness or SA. It's a very complex topic. In essence, it's our perception of reality. And, and since we're human, perception and reality don't always match. You know, it's like perception and reality, you know. <laughs> but as a pilot, uh, you should always be striving to build your SA. It's always going away. You know, it's, it's, it goes stale within seconds, so you always got to be working on it. That's why our cross checks are so important in instrument uh, flight. For my purpose to today, I only want to talk about attitude and energy awareness. If an upset ever happens to you, it's going to come unexpectedly. So by definition, we have to build SA. We have to have a world, have the world to look at if we have the world to look at outside the window, the process is very simple. I mean, the horizon tells us if we're upside down, nose higher, nose low. And generally, the horizon is not prone to tumbling. You know, most airplanes don't have aerobatic uh, instruments. If we resort to the attitude indicator, we have to inject a little systems knowledge. The important thing we need to know about your airplane is whether it has a sky pointer or a fixed index. The approach is different. Here's an example of a sky pointer. 7-3 is the last airplane I flew in the airline world. This is the airplane reference. This is the flight director, these lines right here. This is called the pitch ladder. That's the bank index. 
And if you look at this, you're going to see that it's actually rolling opposite from the roll. The airplane's rolling this way, the bank index is going the other way. That's a sky pointer. It's always going to point towards the sky. And your job, if you have a sky pointer, is uh, to build SA, is to look for that sky pointer because you want to roll in the shortest direction towards the sky pointer, and that's how we do it. This next task is to determine pitch angles. Is it high or low? This determines what maneuver we're going to execute. Finally, we determine where the horizon line is. That's this line here. It's all in black. This one's in black and white. Okay. For most electronic AIs these days, there are always going to be a line. It's usually going to be white between the brown and the blue, so you can find the horizon. Blue is always going to be available, even if it's not real. Uh, the important, this is important because, you know, a friend of mine actually died to make this change, and I think it saved an awful lot of lives. I'll talk about the actual maneuvers later. Right now, we're talking about definitions and uh, getting the picture, okay? So, if you're like the rest of us and have a fixed indice uh, for our, our essay building test, it's going to be a little bit harder. Steam gauge AIs and glass uh, AIs react the same way. Glass is a little better in that it gives you more area to see stuff, but the markings are the same. This is a glass and typical glass indicator. And uh, you can see we have the horizon line, we got the blue, we got the brown. This is the fixed index pointer, and the bank index rolls with the airplane, okay? And uh, it's fixed that way, so it's not a sky pointer. It'll point to the ground wherever you are, so it can't rely on it. But if you th think about it, you can connect the fixed airplane and the bank indicator as your lift vector, all right? So if the lift vector is in the blue, that's good. If it's in the brown, that's bad. This means the, the sky, well, we already know that, blue is the sky. Brown is ground. Uh, look for the pitch, high or low. Look for the horizon, figure out which way to roll, okay? Once you have this sorted out, uh, look at the airspeed. The information you want is above corner velocity. Here's the airspeed right here. And if you're above corner velocity, what do we do? Well, we retard the throttle idle. If we're below corner velocity, we push the, the throttle all the way up. This uh, situation awareness building phase is critical. Focus on this task to the exclusion of all else. Believe what you see and execute based on that. It's what you got. So chair fly the different instrument presentations you might see so you have that in your head. Uh, but take your time. Slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Misinterpreting this display could be disastrous. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, risk management and aeronautical decision making. Um, so we have SA and we have some definitions under our belt and now what? Well, this is the part of prevention that even comes before uh, takeoff. And the, I think this stuff bears repeating, okay? So what is it? And there are a lot of people who have talked about this and you know the FAA has got a program for it and they call it the three Ps, okay? So we wanted to, uh, uh, we want to define the particular hazards that affect our flight. So we use the three P's. First P is the uh, PAVE checklist. Then we're going to process the hazards by using the CARE checklist. And then we're going to mitigate the risks or manage them by doing, performing the team checklist. Okay. So um, that how, that's how we're going to try to figure out what our decisions are and implement and stuff like that. Okay. So, um, sounds real complicated? Eh, let's take a look. First we have the PAVE. Uh, this is the, looks at the pilot first, okay? What is their experience or recent currency? Uh, the experience and type, physical and emotional uh, condition. And then the aircraft looks at the avionics, the equipment, performance, fuel, and how much we need to get there, how much we have on the airplane, all those kind of things. Uh, how much we, have, we, we can carry with the load we're gonna take. The environment took, looks at the airport, weather, runways, lighting, terrain, obstructions, all those things. And then the external pressures looks at personal equipment, delays, diversions, alternative plans. Um, you know, those, those are the kind of things that are driving us to do this anyway. And then secondly, the CARE checklist looks at the consequences uh, that might arise from perceived hazards. And we think about alternatives the thing about alternatives is not just before we take off, we do this continuously throughout the flight, continuously evaluating our situation, whether we're going to divert, we're going to be able to land, we're going to have the fuel, what's the weather like, all those kind of things. We need to address the reality of our current situation and avoid wishful thinking. 
And finally, we need to be mindful again of the external pressures and, our, and the desire to hack the program. We can get in trouble there. Then we have the team approach for risk management. Uh, and, uh, okay, the team transfer, the, 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 the team thing starts with T, transfer. And that contemplates transferring the task, that's the risk decision to someone else. And frankly, I have a problem with that. In the airline and corporate charter world, there's dispatchers and chief pilots that you can pass the buck to, or at least partially. In the GA world, there isn't any of that. It's just you. Well, sometimes you can call a friend, but uh, the bottom line is that you're the one that's gonna make the call. And I think a uh, conservative decision is probably the best course of action in almost all cases. The aeronautical decision-making process uh, there are, is a sum of the total of the decisions that on the ground and in the air that uh, directly affect the execution of any particular sortie. But I'm not going to run you through a scenario here. I'm not going to pull out the soapbox to stand on it. In reality, you only rarely get validated for a good decision while almost everyone's ready to throw spears at you if you make a bad one. I just want you to consider these things as they apply to you and the flight you're about to take in your airplane. To be honest, my personal minimums are pretty high, and uh, I weight the decisions with a healthy dose of conservative skepticism. Okay, I've fulfilled my duty to ADM, so let's go forth and commit aviation. Uh, we're going to be adding skills to all these words shortly, so stick with me. Of course, well, I promised you at the very beginning that I was going to talk about human factors, and what good would a course like this be without a little human factors? There are all sorts of these human factors issues that are relevant to upsets and flying in general, but I'm not gonna talk about them today. I just wanna talk about the one I see is your best bet to stay focused and fly the airplane, okay? And what is that? That is boxes. <laughs> As humans, we perceive danger, uh, when we perceive danger, we were pre-programmed to freeze. After all, if the tiger doesn't see us, we're gonna be fine. Uh, but if that doesn't work, we're programmed to run. You only have to run faster than the last guy. And finally, if we're cornered, the adrenaline, that rush that gets us ready to fight, you know, we're all right, we're gone, we're gonna fight here. But hear me now and believe me later that we are all programmed this way, every one of us. So the question is, how do we as pilots overcome that programming? Because those program pre-programmed reactions are not conducive to successful outcomes when airplanes are involved. They're just not. So how do we focus on flying the plane and ignore the chaff? How do we see through that? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that you use a thing psychology calls a defense mechanism. Whatever. I call it a coping strategy. And I confess that I've been using it for years. And it's called compartmentalization. That's why, that's why boxes, okay? So, essentially the idea is this, is that you take all the things that you're going to do in your life and you put them in boxes, okay? When you get to the airplane, you pull out, put all the work issues in the work box and you personal and family stuff, they get their own box too. And then you open the hangar door and you open the box that uh, says airplane and inside that big box are a bunch of little boxes and the first one you pull out is the pre-flight box. And that's where you're going to focus on looking at the airplane, making sure it's uh, ready to go. And then before you pull it out of the hangar, you're going to run through all those pre-flight uh, planning issues, you know, like flight planning, your course, your fuel required, the three Ps uh, that we just talked about. And uh, you consider all those things before you go commit aviation. If all that passes muster, close that box, pull the airplane out, and then open the start engine box. When that is done, you put that box back in the airplane box and then you open the taxi for takeoff box. Okay? So you can actually see that the, we got a lot of boxes, I got a lot of boxes for each and every one of the major tests I do when I fly. I try to do the same thing the same way every time I go fly. I try to learn something every time and I modify things, but pretty much I want to do it the same way, same day. Some might say that I'm ADD. If you think so, fine. I don't care. I just like to think I'm organized. So go and build boxes for all the phases of flight. And at the right time, you open the box that's appropriate and you focus on what's inside. You execute the plan 
and it was time to move on to the next box, you close that old box, put it away, move on to the next box, okay? Boxes work great. If you make the uh, actions inside each one finely honed, finely tuned uh, to accomplish the task in a comprehensive manner, you're going to find that the task gets done with less drama. And I'm all in favor of lower drama levels. As you can see, I'm not a great actor. One thing to remember about boxes though, and this is just from me to you, and it's really important, is you can't put things in a box and expect them to stay there. Some things get their own boxes, they're not easily organized into subtasks, and that's okay. Life is messy uh, that way. I mean, it is, it just is. Anything with emotion tied into it's gonna definitely need to be let out for air, okay? You can't leave it in the box for a long time. But you don't let the work or the family box intrude on the flying box. The distractions might kill you, and then in all the other boxes don't make any difference. So when you're, you're at work, you focus on the work box. When you're with your family, you focus on your family box. Don't let the stuff in the box go stale. You gotta pull it out every now and again and deal with it. Eventually, you're gonna pay the price and it won't be pretty, okay? So that's my uh, human factors pitch. If you want more, talk more about boxes, we can do that. Now I want to talk about upsets. In the light GA, uh, light plane world, you can just choose to avoid flying. Just don't go if it's dark and scary. In the bizjet world, in the airline world, you can just you can't avoid it completely. And even in GA, sometimes you can run into it unintentionally. There are things in the air that you might not be able to predict with any certainty. Things like wind shear, microbursts, brake turbulence, mountain waves mechanical turbulence, and there are things that are dumped directly in your lap through no fault of your own, control malfunctions, instrument anomalies, engine failures, especially low altitude and low energy, stall warning in the takeoff or landing phase, uh, control flight to terrain, inappropriate flight control or power responsibility, high altitude flight characteristics, loss of SA, uh, don't forget delayed response and automation errors, okay, and then dependency. Brrr, it gets complicated, sure. But in all situations, what we need to be able to do is focus down and see through the chaff and distractions and concentrate on flying the airplane first. And that's what this course is about. So let's go have some fun. Thanks for watching. And now that we savvy some, uh, some of the definitions and uh, ground, ground rules, etc., uh, let's go flying. Let's, I'll see you on the ramp.